please join me in welcoming Jock Sarong here tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. So, Jock, can you tell us a little bit about the origins of the settlement? Yeah. Um, well, it goes back... This book goes back well before I was a writer at all. Um, I've been going to Flinders Island in Bass Strait with my family... Uh, 25, 28 years, and um, we now have a house on on Flinders Island, and the house has two chimneys made of brick, and there are no brickworks on the island. So the house is a mile from the ruins of Waibalina, and the bricks appear to have come out of those ruins at some point historically. And I had looked at those chimneys a lot and thought about these strange bricks, which are clearly convict made, and... That sort of led into an obsession with with the site of the of the settlement, which is now all that's left is these windswept paddocks and long grass and some piles of broken bricks. Um, there's a chapel there, which has been restored, and there's a graveyard. And the graveyard is probably oh, nearly an acre. Um, one corner of it is walled off, and it has conventional engraved headstones. And that's all the white settlers. And the rest of it is just empty grass. And there's some hundreds of Aboriginal people under that grass. And it's a very, very um, evocative, eerie place. So I, going there over all those decades, um, I had thought a lot about that place. And, and people in remote communities, and particularly on islands, are really good storytellers. And people would tell stories about the wrecks in the islands and about the settlement. and. Um, so I felt once I started writing novels, this was always looming. It was mm. always something I was going to have to try to engage with. And the way that I framed it up in my head was that there's 50 years in Australian history when a lot of really important things happened in the Furno Islands and prior to that point, they were something of a, of a geographical enigma in that Bass Strait would flood and empty and flood and empty over ice ages and Aboriginal people would walk across from the continent to Tasmania when Bass Strait was empty. They'd be cut off when it flooded. And and a sort of parallel process happened with the Europeans when they started coming to Australia, that they couldn't work out what Bass Strait was, whether it was a bay or some sort of large inlet or whether there was a river cutting the mainland or what it was. And it was this shipwreck in 1797 that sorted it all out, that revealed it to be a strait. So... I I wanted to write a novel about the 50 years from that shipwreck of the Sydney Cove through to the closure of the settlement in 1847. I thought, there's the 50 years when when all of these things happened. Um, But as soon as I started writing the story, I realised it was far too complex Mm. to cram into one novel, so it became three novels. So in that sense, it's it's a bit of an accidental trilogy. Um, But this is, yeah, this is the closure of that close view of the 50 years, I guess. Well, it's extraordinary. And your research, because there isn't a lot... Is there a lot of written history about what no. happened to the Indigenous peoples of what we call Tasmania? No, there's very little, um, and, and that perhaps suits my ends, because mm. I'm not... Um, contrary to what you might think, I'm not a great researcher at all. I, um, I, I'm a very, very obsessive reader... <laughs> So I I can read a lot of stuff, but I'm not good at finding things in archives like lots of other people are. Um, So this subject matter works really well for me because um, if you take the first novel, um, what you've got there is a diary of a survivor and a shipwreck. And so I can work off those two resources. The, The shipwreck, in some physical sense, corroborates or contradicts what the diary says. Here, I've got the ruins of the settlement, which are are really um, a silent place that you have to... You have to make yourself very quiet and small to feel it talking to you. Um, And on the other hand, you've got Robinson's diaries, which are enormous. And Mm. Robinson was an obsessive diarist. He wrote down every day of his work for years and years and years, and he wrote down every prosaic detail of what he was doing. Can you give us just a little potted history of Robinson himself? Because yeah. not everyone here will know who you're talking about. Yeah, the, the, the difficulty with this subject matter is that as soon as you step in at one point, you have to <laughs> go miles back to mm. start again. But if we go miles back, um, the Tasmanian settlement started around whatever it was, 1802, 1805. It was confined very tightly to Hobart for quite a while. 
But then, of course, people needed land for stock and crops, so they started spreading up into the midlands of Tasmania, pushing Aboriginal people back the whole time. And that process has played out all over the continent, but the Tasmanian version of this is that um, the Tasmanian Aboriginal peoples, who are known as Palawa and Pakana people, started to fight back, and there were reprisal killings, there were public hangings in Hobart in the early 1820s, which really accelerated the conflict rather than resolving it in any way. Um, and, and there was a genocide taking place. And the first response to the genocide was the governor tried this thing called the Tasmanian Line, which was assembling 4,500 people to walk across Tasmania. And in theory, at least, they were going to flush out all of the remaining Palawa and Pakana people. When they got to the other end, they wound up with an old man and a small boy. And that's not because everybody was wiped out. It's because all of the Palawa and Pakana people simply walked through the line. Mm. So that failed. That was 1828. And the next intervention was this guy Robinson turning up. And Robinson was a bricklayer. He came from London. Um, he was, he is, a really weird historical figure. He, he's kind of an enigma. Um, extremely religious, extremely ambitious, not highly educated, um, not a great charismatic leader of people. Um, but he went to the governor and he said, I have an idea to resolve your problem. And the governor was all ears because he was out of solutions. And the idea was that Robinson would go out into the wilds of Tasmania, he would find Aboriginal people, negotiate with them and bring them in safely, and then dot, dot, dot. Nobody had an end game for this idea. Governor said, go for it. So Robinson went out into the wilds many times over and recorded every one of these expeditions in his diaries and um, brought in the Tasmanians. And it was only once he had brought in some hundreds of people that he and others started to devise the next step, which was to place them somewhere. Which was on the island in Bass Strait. Yeah, he, he tried a number of solutions that didn't work. He tried a number of islands um, and settled on Waibalina, which is... Flinders Island is uh, it's 60 kilometres north to south and 30 wide, and there's a little promontory that juts out of the west side of the island called Pea Jacket Point, mm. and they decided they'd place the settlement on Pea Jacket Point. No fresh water or, or a very, very limited amount of fresh water. It's extremely windy. Um, and significantly, you, at the settlement, you can't see the ocean, although you're surrounded by it. And there's, there's debate about whether that's accident or design. Mm. Well, the way you bring Robinson to life in this novel, um, it makes me think it was by design, you know, Absolutely. because yeah. there's a lot of um, shocking things that he's done. You actually bring a, a really shocking clarity to the past, but this is not to say, this is a really compelling novel. Um, particularly once, um, so part one is with Robinson out there in the wild and he's actually, I won't say made friends, but he has uh, convinced uh, one of the great leaders um, of the Indigenous people, I don't know if I'm going to say Manalagena. Uh, Manalagena. Manalagena, <laughs> okay. Manalagena, who was actually an incredible man. Uh, we know uh, quite a bit about him. Um, and we even have a picture of him, um, that, that he was doing this good thing for Managalana's people and um, in going out and trying to bring them in. So part one of the book is about that. Um, we, ha we are introduced to these characters, to some of the Indigenous people, Managalana and his, his, um, some of his tribe, a little boy called Welk and Robinson himself. So we get a real, really strong insight into the character of this man Robinson and what he's sort of on about. And then the second part of the novel is set uh, on the island um, at the settlement at Pea Jacket Point, which is you just you're reading it and you're thinking, what were they thinking? It's just so appalling mm. this place. But so it, it's a very compelling account and story. It's it's a novel. There's a lot of fictional characters in it as well, mm. um, like the catechist. I assume he's fictional. I hope so. Yeah, although that's a <laughs> that's another whole discussion in its own right. There were catechists. Yeah. Um, some of whom were good people and some of whom were monsters. And, yeah. and so I suppose he is an amalgam of, of all of them. Okay, well, I'll get to him a bit later. Yeah. So um, 
you obviously felt impelled to write this bo book at some point, and some of your previous novels are clearly about issues that you feel very strongly about, refugees, um, 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 you know, other, among other things, but did you feel that you wanted to bring some of these terrible injustices to light? Is that part of the yeah, compulsion it, to write? It's or? interesting that, um, you know, whenever anyone writes a novel, you're following your nose to some extent. You don't often know why you're doing what you're doing, mm. and it only becomes clear in the writing. Mm. And I think that was the case here, that um, I started telling a story because there was a story to tell, and also because the story of Wybelina is the only logical end point of the 50-year project mm. that I was talking about. There's no other way to end it. Um, I think the more I, I have worked over the drafts and since the book has come out, I think the reason I was doing it probably was because the story is not widely known and that mm. amazes me that it's such important history and also because it's such a striking example of the things that we're still doing wrong. So here was a way of talking about something that happened 200 years ago that we are doing right now in Australia and we think that the frontier, we think that colonialism is something that's behind us and was awful but we're all nice people. Where um, We may indeed all be nice people but we're, we are repeating the mistakes. Absolutely true and I, I note from what from your writing and this is just superbly written, there's just so many things I'd love to tell you about as you can see. Um, <laughs> anyway, but one of the things that really comes through is a sort of, there's this just vast disjunct between the ideas, perceptions and cultures of the indigenous peoples um, and the British themselves. And I think this still is something that's occurring all the time. We get these, these huge abysses between people's perceptions of each other and, and the British certainly saw themselves as completely superior yes. and therefore entitled to treat the indigenous people the way they did. Can you talk a bit about how you... Because you must have come to a really clear understanding or good understanding of, for instance, 19th century religious beliefs, mm. the 19th century culture. So can you talk to us about There's that? There's a really interesting PhD paper that you can look up um, written by a guy called Finlay about religious practices at Waibalina. Oh. And it gets a bit technical at times, all these tiny little shades of Protestantism that I didn't quite follow. But... Um, it, it does make clear that um, there was a genuine belief in these settlers that they were going to bring Aboriginal people into the light of God's love. Um, their, their conviction about that was really striking. And yet, it has to involve one... accepting the notion that one theory of divinity is superior to another, mm. which is itself a ridiculous idea. Um, we know from some of Robinson's documents, some of his letters and the journal, that he... We know about the eulogy that he gave when Manuel Agena died. And he <gasps> says this... He has this spiel about... I um, hoped that was made up. No, it isn't. Oh. Um, other things are, but that's not... Um, wow. He says to the gathering, to the mourners, that the last thing Manuel Agena said to me was that he doesn't want to go back to his country, he wants to go to heaven and be with God, mm -hmm. and that if you told him to go back to his country, he would be very upset and he would say, no, I want to be with God. So I imagined a conversation between Robinson and Manuel Agena on his deathbed in which Manuel Agena says, don't you dare tell them that bullshit, it's not true. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he goes and does it. So what I've fictionalised that precursor, but Robinson did, in fact, say this thing. And to me... That amounts to politicising the very idea of heaven, mm. um, which is an extraordinary arrogance. Um, there are times when, when you, find, you feel yourself swerving back into sympathising with Robinson's sincerity, that he's so convinced of the good of what he's doing. And then you look at the destruction that's built into it and, and you swerve back to hating him. That's mm. why he's such an enigma. I'm just going to read this paragraph, if I may. <coughs> so... Um, they were saved, that was the message. They were leaving for an island where they would live as free people and could devote themselves to thanking God and learning European ways. The old people had fallen quiet, perhaps because they explained everything in stories and they simply had no story for this preposterous idea. Mm. And I think that's beautifully expressed because it must have been such a baffling thing to the Indigenous peoples. Yes. And to, it, to have these Europeans turn up in their country and start doing all these things to them. 
Yes, and, and there's two separate ideas at play behind the whole enterprise. One is that Robinson made a promise to Manalagena, which he was foolish enough to reduce to writing, which was, I'm going to take you off your lands. If you come with me, I'll get you out of the way of the settlers and you'll be safe. I'll take you somewhere as a refuge until it's safe to go home. And when you go back to your lands, I'm going to come and live among you, essentially as a human shield. They won't trouble you if I'm there. This was the promise that he made a number of times and wrote down. And, of course, he never fulfilled. Mm -hmm. The other... So that's one kind of organising principle. The other organising principle was not Robinson's, it, it was other people's, but it was that we're going to Christianise and civilise these people. Christianise and civilise. So Robinson, when, when he so-called rescued the Tasmanians, he didn't say to anybody, and we're going to turn you into Christians and teach you building trades and teach the women how to sew. That was other people's idea, but it was also a very important um, engine behind the enterprise. The other thing that comes through really clearly, and this is something that's often occurred to me through my life, I have Indigenous heritage, so I don't know, perhaps this is part of why I've thought this, is this dividing up of land mm. with fences and everyone gets their little bit in mm. our world, in the, in the European-based world. Um, but this was not how... Indigenous people treated the land. They didn't divide up and they didn't have the same concept of property. No. But this is something that you express so beautifully um, in this book in several places, I have to say. Um, and I think it's a really such an important concept because the whole idea that, you know, Western civilization is based on the concept of property. So people, people back in the day hundreds of years ago, you would be killed for stealing someone's property. You'd be put to death for doing that, whereas you might not be put to death for a much, what we would consider a much more serious crime because property was everything. And this is something that um, I think is another kind of abyss between the European settlers and certainly Robinson. Mm. He has a lot to say about property yes. uh, in the book. Can you yeah. tell us a bit about well, that? Well, you just reminded me that it, it, I think it's the only joke that I self-consciously wrote into the book. <laughs> which was that in this imagined deathbed conversation between Robinson and Manalagena, Robinson's talking about an obscure piece of English legal theory that you get taught in property law. When I hated property law with mm. a passion. But this, this idea was really striking to me, which is that one of the theorists said that no matter who you are and how poor you are, only you can ever have autonomy over the space that your body mm. occupies. Um, which is weird, and, and it's hard to know how you commercialise that, but let, let's take it at face value. That you, th there is a certain amount of space that is the volume of your body and only you can ever have autonomy over it. Um, he puts this to Manalagena, which he probably didn't do, on his deathbed, and Manalagena says, so what, is that, is that all that you've got? I thought you had a place in Hobart. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, Robinson, of course, had property everywhere and he was a very good investor and he wound up very wealthy. Mm but estranged from his family. Yes. Which I thought was quite justified, actually. <laughs> Terrible man. Um, yes, because one of the things... That th so, something I should just mention. You never mention Robinson by name yes. in the novel, yes. which I really appreciated. <laughs> but do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, I don't mention any of the um, settler staff of the settlement by name. Mm. Two reasons. One is that um, the settlement ran for 14 years and... There were a number of people who held each of these positions. So I think there were nine commandants. There were at least three or four catechists, uh, a number of surgeons, a number of storekeepers, a number of coxswains. Um, and to some extent, Robinson is Robinson, but in, in, in regards to a lot of the other roles, I wanted to merge them a bit mm. and use um, combined characteristics of several of the people who held the office. So there was that. The other reason was that... Um, I've always found that everything I've read about early Australian history, whether it's fiction or non-fiction, and I don't mean recent works, but earlier works, mm. Aboriginal people were always reduced to generic mm. kind of figures. It's always the Aborigines. And the explorer on the horse always got their name, and even their convicts got their name. You know, we know that Burke and Wills's convict was king. And um, that that's obviously an injustice of a linguistic sort. And I just thought it would be interesting to flip it on its head and make the white people generic and make the Aborigines um, fully realised individuals, just to sort of see what that would do to the storytelling. Mm. 
Well, I actually appreciate it for those reasons, but I think also because it reminded me a little bit of when we've had some of these horrific um, killings, like the one in New Zealand, and the media chooses not to name the perpetrator. Yes. And I felt there was an element of that. Certainly for me, I appreciated that he wasn't named because he just committed such an appalling yes. atrocity, really, uh, him and many others, um, and particularly the catechist you have in the book. But um, And so I felt it was actually really wonderful that, that the people like Manigalena were, were named, um, his sister, whose name I cannot pronounce. Tuganapatutna. Thank you. <laughs> Tuganapatutna. <laughs> they're lovely names. It's a be- they're great names. Yeah. They're beautiful names. Um, but my but you bring me back to a point about naming, which is that I think naming and unnaming, mm. this, this will sound obvious, but it took me a while to, for it to dawn on me, um, naming and unnaming are, are acts of power, and when you name a child you immediately set in train their identity. Mm. Um, and I think the settlers were keenly aware of this as an idea, and Robinson was keenly aware of this, and he took a great delight in naming people. So children would come in, and they would either have their, their traditional name, um, or they would have a nickname that had been conferred on them by stockmen or sealers or, or whomever. And Robinson would depending on the nature of the nickname, he would either run with the nickname or he would rename them after royalty. Mm. So th- there's, a, there's a man in there who he renames King William and he names mm. a woman Queen Adelaide. And um, Truganini carried all sorts of names, um, as did Taranora. And that process of taking people's original identity off them and conferring a new mm. one is a way of saying, I have power over you. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think the saddest and clearest example of that is a guy called William Lanny, who was the youngest child of the last family to be taken to Waibalina. And he arrived with his parents, and Robinson's diary records that William Lanny arrived at the settlement, his name is lost. And that's impossible because he turned up with his parents. So for a start, Robinson is choosing to expunge his name, but William Lanny lived quite a long life by the standards of these people, and... Um, towards the end of his life, he was a survivor of Waibalina, as was Truganini. Towards the end of, end of his life, he knew that he was going to be anatomised by the surgeons. And that he goes through this terrible process of begging not to be cut up. And, of course, they cut him up. And it means that if you look at that lifetime, at the beginning of his life, his name was taken off him. And at the end of his life, his body was taken off him. Um, that's an extraordinary act of theft at both ends of a life, mm. isn't it? Well, that's something I actually wanted to, to move to. There's so much I want to talk about. But anyway, we're going to run out of time. I just know we are. Um, so there's a pit about anatomy's long journey to understanding. Uh, Robinson, this is what he thinks about uh, anatomising um, the Indigenous people who are meant to be under his care, um, and in fact who should be roaming in their own lands with autonomy, and they don't have it. So one of the things that was done is that they were, um, after they died, and many of them died on Wabalena, um, they were cut up, their heads were sent to London, their bodies were sent to London um, uh, against their wishes. Um, and, of course, it made me think... Um, so he talks about it's a prize. So um, uh, Margalena's head was meant to go to London and his body was all meant to be all cut up and, and sent as well because such an artefact must not be lost. And so this idea was that um, in the 19th century you could tell a great deal from supposedly about a person's character, about their decision-making, about their intelligence from the shape of their head and the way their body was formed. And so this is uh, the Indigenous peoples of Australia were meant to be part of the sort of creating these links to understanding. This is really appalling, actually. Um, so this anatomising really happened. Have mm. we reclaimed any of those? Yeah, there's a process underway and um, there's a writer for The Guardian called Paul Daly who's done a lot of work on this. Um, the South Australian Museum seems to be the, the central point of a lot of this work. Mm. Um, there's a million miles to go, th- but there's, I, I think the SA Museum has 4,500 people or the remains of 4,500 people in its collection. There's remains in Germany, obviously, Britain. Um, there's remains throughout Europe. Um, and not only, it should be said, of Australian Aboriginal people, but of Pacific Islanders, of Maori people. Um, and, and that's a really long, slow process. Mm. And, and we saw with the repatriation of Mungo Man, 
um, just mm. recently how sensitive and complex it mm. can be even when the skeleton is 35,000 years old. It's, it's an extremely difficult thing to do. So the, what was done in haste and in secrecy is enormously slow and painstaking and painful to undo. One of the things that really struck me, particularly reading your, the settlement this week, was the Queen has died, as we all know, mm. and um, Managalena was a great leader of his tribe. Imagine if someone wanted to cut up the Queen and send off her body or her head for examination or scientific progression. I mean, there would be just worldwide outrage. Mm. And yet we've done this again and again to Indigenous peoples. Uh, we had no right to do it, but we did it anyway. And as you say, in secret, which I find appalling. Anyway, that's me. You write so beautifully about so many things. Um, your <laughs> descriptions, um, you create characters that are just so real. I did, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, is this from the historical record? Is this, are you making this up? What is this? <laughs> it's so beautifully done because it is a novel, but, but really, really um, based in incredibly um, clever, um, lightly diffused research. So it's got the whole, it's the iceberg effect. Nine-tenths of it is your research and understanding and deep perception, I would have to say. And then the, the top tenth is the book, which is just beautiful. But well, I, get, I get in trouble sometimes with my editor, Mandy, because um, I go off researching and I find something that completely fascinates me, so I change the story to jam it in. And she has an uncanny eye for when this has happened. And she just oh. puts a red pen through it and says, take <laughs> it out. I know it's in there because you found it and we don't need it. <laughs> But you also have really wonderful um, insight into human nature. And one of the things I was really appreciative of was your brilliant line about false equivalence when the catechist is talking to Robinson. Can you tell us about that? Uh, I don't want to give away the end of the book, but that, that thing where Robinson, the catechist is just this monstrous being. And to me, he actually, it was almost as if he represented all of the darkness that happens in the, that's in, that's in the history of our treatment of the Indigenous peoples. Yeah. Um, he may not have for you, but that's what he did for that, me. That's almost what he is. Yeah. Right, uh, yeah, sort of like it's a amalgam of, of, yes. of, of distortion and, and, and horror, you know. Yeah, so in, in terms of his um, lineage, he, obviously I thought of him at the start of preservation. Mm. So the preservation, there are three survivors who walk into Sydney or who almost walk into Sydney. And um, one of them is a guy called William Clark who's a merchant. And one of them is a 14, 15 year old Lascar boy. So he's a, a Bengali boy from Calcutta. Um, and one of them is, is sort of unknown. So I decided to install my bad guy, Mr. Fig. Mm. And they were supposed to represent three faces of what um, settlement represents. So. Uh, the boy is innocence and wide-eyed wonder and appreciation of the beauty and trust and all of those qualities. Clark, the merchant, is the cynical exploitation of everything you see, the, the, the careless using of things. Mm. Um, and then Fig is just the outright malice. And, of course, as the, as the trilogy has progressed, I'm left with Fig, so I, I'm only left with the malicious figure to work with. Um, the, 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 probably the literary lineage is um, Judge Holden in Blood Meridian um, and a book called The North Water, which is just one of my favourite modern novels, which has a bad guy in it called Henry Drax. Mm. And, and I think the three male villains probably share a lot of characteristics. Okay. But he does this brilliant thing because y you hate the catechist for everything he is and does, and a lot of what he does is secretive. You don't... It's never completely clear exactly what he's doing but you know he's just this horrendous person and yet and he's clever which is so annoying because you don't want him to be clever because he's evil but um at one point robinson tries to take control and i think to upbraid him they're in the surgeons uh, in the anatomizing room i think and and um he basically threatens uh the catechist but the catechist comes back and basically threatens Robinson back by saying, well, I'll let people know about your, you know, anatomising and your sending off of things that, you know, you're not meant to be doing. And, and it's just this brilliant line about false equivalence and ha how often it is that one of us has an argument that's strong and sound and the person you're telling your point of view to just comes back with something that's completely not right but just crushes your argument. 
Mm. It's like that. And I think that's that's the way that that's a reading that I got from Robinson's diaries that mm. he put a lot of work into convincing himself of the merits of his own positions, um, and yet you can they, they leap off the page as bad ideas again and mm. again. Mm. Um, but he can't help himself. No, well that becomes really clear. There's this fantastic, um, well, it's a terrible exchange really. It's when um, Mana Lagena is dying. And um, I'll just read this little bit, if I may. Okay. <clears throat> so he says, uh, this is the Commandant Robinson. He says, the mission must continue on its own terms, Manalagana. The children learning their arithmetic, their psalms, the adults must find their way to God. There is no other path to salvation. God spat the chief. He was gasping, a landed fish in a bed. Salvation is universal, dear friend. The Lord God does not distinguish between the native and the Englishman. He loves the lowest of men and the highest the same. And you're like, well, okay, so clearly the <laughs> Manigalana and all his people are the lowest and Robinson and all the British people are the highest. And it's just this extraordinary um, moment, I think, of absolute clarity where you get Robinson's genuine point yeah. of view. Yeah, and, and, well, that, that little scene, I, it's probably the most dangerous thing creatively in the book because it is made up. There's mm. no evidence that Manigalana and Robinson had that discussion. Mm. But it felt to me like it was the point at which I could have a meeting of those ideas, of Manalagena's fury and Robinson's defence of what he was doing. Mm. Um, Robinson really believed himself to be this very, very important historical witness, that he was going to be the person who was there when the Tasmanians lapsed into extinction and that he was going to record everything that happened and that he would become the toast of Europe because he was there at the demise of a colonised people, um, which is a horrifying idea in its own right. But I think part of the reason, aside from compulsion, part of the reason that he wrote these diaries was to build the bedrock for the great book that he was going to write. Mm. And the other thing that he did was to hire this convict painter called Thomas Bock to do a series of portraits of the main Aboriginal people that Robinson had with him. And one of the things that really struck me when I was doing the research was the portraits. They, um, they're really easy to Google up and you only have to look into those eyes to see the sheer horror. Um, they're incredibly affecting images. Mm. And so I, for a long time I was unsure what role they had in what I was doing. I could see why Robinson had them because he wanted to have an illustrated book. Um, I, I, I struggled to work out what I would do with them and, and the answer I came to was to have, th there's this little middle section in the book where you spend a little bit of time with Bock painting the portraits. So, um, Manalagena, um, that's Manalagena, Truganini, and Wurudi are the three portraits that I've used. And you're, you're with Bock while Bock is talking to them while he's painting them. And it's it's a, you know, if if imagine a sitter and a subject, there's a kind of stream of consciousness thing going on along the lines of so tell me about your job or whatever the case may be. Um, and that felt like a way of, it's the last point at which those people were somewhat free and autonomous. That they were painted in Hobart after they'd come in from the bush. After that, they're on a boat and they're on Mybelina, so they are essentially inmates, um, depending how you want mm -hmm. to look at what the settlement was, but their, their freedom is over after, after that mm -hmm. portrait is painted. Um, yeah, and, and by the way, the book never got published. No one quite knows why, but Robinson went from Waibalina to Victoria where he did similar work but not as effectively, and I use that word advisedly. Um, and he then went to Europe and toured around and gave public lectures, um, but he never released the book. Interesting. Well, perhaps you write, I love this, it's so beautifully done. It suited the Commandant that it was like this. He wanted to walk to escape the incessant business of being himself in that place. He was more positioned than man, queuing to take time with himself. Hmm. I think that's so beautifully written. Oh, he was so really struck perceptive. by his own importance. Oh, he was. <laughs> and you have this wonderful phrase. His diaries were, writ were, quote, written with a propagandist's eye to posterity. Hmm. And I think that's just brilliant because, <laughs> you know, there are people in the world who do. They write their diaries and their journals and their letters with an eye to posterity one day reading them. Um, and again, it's one know. of the very basic lessons of... Um, historical research, which I took a while to get to, which mm. is that any historical res, um, resource in the archive is, is written with an agenda mm. and it's probably lying to you in one way or another. 
So there's not um, a level you can go back to where the truth resides as a fiction writer. You don't sit up here writing fiction and then go back to the truth now and then because what's back here is partially fiction as well. And Robinson is, is a clear example of this, that yes, he recorded everything he saw and heard and smelt and felt around him, but he was doing it for a reason and, and that means that you've got to take him pretty cynically as a source. Oh, absolutely. But that's one of the great things about fiction because I think often in a really well-written book, as well-written as this one is, there's often a lot of truth in fiction, sometimes more truth in fiction than perhaps you find in the archives. And as someone who's been in the archives a lot, <laughs> I think that's, uh, that's probably true. Um, so there's so much uh, clarity in this book. There's moments of clarity, I think. Um, is one particularly good one when the Commandant recognises that he is the most wretched of creatures, the Judas. Mm. I don't want to give too much away. But yeah. yeah, well, he, he's definitely the Judas in the sense that he's made a promise and betrayed this great man. Mm. He, he is the betrayer of the great man, uh, which is, has and led pretty directly to his death. Yeah. Yes, and his people. Um, he, he's definitely that. Um, there are weird literary continuities to someone like Robinson. You can find him everywhere, and I think the most horrifying parallel is probably the Pied Piper, mm. that he wrote these letters back to London and, and to Hobart and to Sydney. He was writing letters of complaint the whole time in which he says in as many words, I fixed your problem, I got rid mm. of these people, I've cleared your lands, why won't you pay me more money? Mm. Why won't you promote me? Why won't you assist me with this or that? Um, He's essentially writing back to Hamelin, which is the most awful of mm. ideas, but mm. it's there. And, and the idea of him as the Judas and, again, the, you know, the bag of silver pieces and Potter's Field, all of those things resonate through um, the way he appears in the diary. Is that something... Is that the link to the silver coins that the storekeeper puts in the tree? No, I, I think it's there. That That is available as a link. But okay. no, the idea was... Um, I don't know where it came from, but it fascinated me. Yeah. Um, the, the, I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to it's talk about this, is I it? Don't I don't think... Don't it, well, I don't know. I don't think so, because it's such a an alternative sort of thing, and you mm. don't see where it comes in the book. No, no. I, I'm amazed it survived the editing, to be honest. But um, the storekeeper is... One of the ideas behind the book is that... Um, a troubled conscience will drive you mad if it's not resolved in some way, that people can only carry so much guilt on their souls before they start to collapse. And the storekeeper is racked with guilt. He's, he's probably the only white character in the book who really feels the full horror of what they're doing and, and it troubles him deeply. And you can sense him starting to crack up towards the end of the book. And one of the things he does is he goes out into the forest around the edges of the settlement with um, a pocket full of coins, which he's carefully noted in the store to make sure he's not stealing from the store. Mm. Um, and he cuts a chip into the tree trunks and he hammers the coins into the tree trunks and then seals the wound with a bit of sealing wax. And um, Welk is watching him do this and Welk's really puzzled. And he explains to Welk that the reason he's doing this thing is because he fears that centuries hence, in other words, what I'm looking at, you know, every year, um, the trees will have fallen down and the buildings will have been taken away and the materials pillaged for other buildings and even the stone wall that he's building is made of limestone and it will have dissolved and there will be no record. He doesn't know about Robinson's diary other than Robinson always seems to be working. The record of what they have done and the stain that's on their souls will, will vanish and there will be no accounting for what had happened in this place. And he's hammering coins into trees in the hope that when they ultimately fall over that people will find the coins and that they'll remain there as a sort of physical remnant of the fact that they were there. Mm. It's a kind of abstract idea of dealing with your guilt, but that was what I, I felt he might do. Well, it's brilliant and it's a good place to bring to an end because I think while there may not be much physical remnant of what happened on Waibalena, you've created an extraordinary um, account of that really important part of our history, whether we like it or not. And I think it's a beautifully written book, um, incredibly perceptive and insightful, and congratulations, because it's just 
an amazing read. And so if you have any real, you know, anyone with any interest in Australian history or really coming to an understanding, a greater understanding of some of the things in our past, and I do think it's important that we do that in order to do better in the future, this is a fantastic book. So congratulations, Thanks, Jock. Jock. Well Thank done. Thank you very much. Thanks. We're going to hand over to questions. We have a roving mic, so if you have a question, just wait for the mic so everyone can hear the question. Just Hello. Hello. Do I need the mic? I'm like... Yeah, you do, for the recording. Oh, OK. Um, um, Jock, can you speak about um, the consultation process or any conferencing or anything you, you had with the First Nations people that are involved in the story? Yeah. Um, Great question. Tasmania is a, a kind of a unique context in um, consulting in, in, ab in Indigenous storytelling for a white person. And the reason why is that um, modern Tasmanians identify through probably three separate sources. Um, so there is, there, there's the people who weren't gathered up in the Robinson missions who remained on the Tasmanian mainland and had descendants. Um, there is the people who are the descendants of the Waibalina people and then there's the people who are descendants of the women who were taken by sealers into the same islands, which is a separate movement of humans. So three different lines, and that's resulted in multiple different ways of identifying as a Tasmanian Aborigine. Up until um, probably the late 80s, the conventional wisdom was the Tasmanians are extinct. I was certainly brought up believing mm -hmm. this. Um, and it's patently not true. And we know from census data that more and more Tasmanians are identifying as Aboriginal every census. Um, there are groups for whom language is lost and the only language that we know is that which was written down by people like Robinson. There are groups for whom language can be reconstructed and should be. Um, there are disputes about homelands. Um, it's a difficult, thorny area and as a white writer, you know, you've got to be mm. so careful wading into it. So, um, aside from consultation, what I've tried to do is to remain at a distance in the storytelling where I've left the, the Aboriginal story wide open. Um, I've tried to write the white story, and I think white writers have a responsibility to write the white story. It's quite hard to say. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think you can shirk it by saying, oh, this is difficult. Um, and it is difficult. As for consultation, I, I went out, you know, um, a consultation tends to lead to another, to another, to another. And people sent me to more people. Um, there were definitely people I approached and organisations I approached who said, no, we don't want any part of this. You're on your own. No one said, don't write it. But people definitely said, um, this is not something I'm going to support. Um, so I should be clear about that, you know, that, that there is not one Homogenous person... group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the whole the whole error here for Robinson and people like him was this idea of homogeneity. Mm. Um, so you, you have success and help and support in some areas and you have silence in others and um, that's essentially where it's landed. But in, in consulting with people, I you know, the way that it works is sort of a, a, an initial casual approach and then a more formal interview and then providing that section of the manuscript to that person and saying, have I got this right? They come back with changes, you do it again. Um, and, and I think, you know, another step probably in the process is that at some stage I've got to go down to the islands and, and talk to the community down there and uh, rather than just be remote from it. Mm. Great question, thank you. Um, any other questions? Please, yep, over here. Thanks, Jock. I really enjoyed your um, conversation. Thank you. Um, now, you mentioned at the beginning of the um, talk about uh, Robinson's intention was to bring um, uh, the Indigenous people into God's love. Mm. Now, was the understanding, was his understanding or was the general feeling at the time that they were attempting to assimilate uh, Indigenous people into uh, a, a white culture or were they smoothing the pillow with the belief that they were going to yeah. eventually die out? Well, I think that's one of the fundamental historical questions here mm. um, because I know that the Finlay thesis talks about this problem of, let's say you train all the men in trades and you train all the women to cook and to sew and to clean and, and essentially you create 
kind of reconstructed Europeans, what do they then do? You know, do they go back to Tasmania and live those lives somehow in houses? There was never any thought given to the next step. And the smoothing the pillow idea, I think, ultimately I think that was Robinson's idea, particularly when, when he frames himself as a witness to the loss of the Tasmanians. I don't know that that was the universal position. I think there were other people who believed it was assimilation. Um, but there was so little... There was, there was such urgency about the front end of the task, which was, we need to get these people away from the bullets. Um, and, and some of that was, was very genuinely held, but there was very, very little thought given to, yes, once we've done it, what do we then have and, and how do these people then live? And um, I think even the assimilationists hadn't come to a view about that. So it remains, to me anyway, it remains an unresolved question. So in your book where you write, um, the Commandant sighed. For a long time he did not respond. I have seen most things now, he said eventually. They are a benighted race and before we can study all the fascinating traits wrought by their isolation, they will be gone. It is inevitable. So mm. was that him from the diaries? Are you getting some sense of that from the diaries? Yeah, that, that's paraphrasing him. He certainly uses the word benighted a lot. Yep. Um, I, th I think he saw them as inherently cursed, and, and not by Europeans, but inherently. Yeah. Um, that's not an uncommon concept historically. Yeah. That, that dark skin, you know, the mark of Cain, that sort of nonsense. That yes. Some people have thought down through history. Yes, although... This is where Robinson is so elusive. If you take his friendly missions... So, so there's a historian called Plomley who collected all of Robinson's journals and a whole lot of corroborating letters into these enormous books. In, he did it in the 60s and the 80s. And the, the, the records of the friendly missions, Robinson comes across as incredibly attuned to the way that Tasmanian Aboriginal people operated. He makes so many observations mm -hmm. about... Um, hunting and about their handicrafts and about song and dance and all sorts of things. Um, and he's very interested and he sees the societies as complex. Mm. But somewhere along the way he lost that interest and he became much more interested in this sort of anth anthropological thinking about anatomising and about phrenology and about cursed races. And he almost seemed to Europeanise his own thinking towards these movements of colonisation and, and the loss of lesser societies. Um, so he's, he's not one person, he's a number of people mm. through those years, I think. Mm. Okay, that's fascinating. Uh, another question? Anyone? Yeah, okay, yeah, that's fine, <laughs> you're allowed to have two. <laughs> um, just, uh, it was really an observation, but um, you, you, you mentioned it again, and that is, um, what was the purpose of uh, Robinson's diaries? And, mm. um, and I know that uh, Plomley did an unbelievable job yeah. transcribing those diaries mm. because Robinson had the most horrendous handwriting. It's awful. And mm. I, I, I don't think any, I challenge anyone to <laughs> decipher it these days. So I'm pretty sure he was writing for himself rather than for posterity in a sense. Yeah. Um, uh, unless he was going to re retranslate it into a publication, which, as you say, never happened. Um, I'm not sure where I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite um, okay. I, th I think just to take up that point, one of the really interesting things that Plomley did, and he must have been just an extraordinary worker, was that not only did he decipher that handwriting and then also find points of corroboration in the correspondence, but he also drew out lots and lots of little secret jokes that Robinson was having with himself. Mm. There's this theory that Plomley had, and it's, it's not necessarily fact, but he believed there was an affair going on between Robinson and the storekeeper's wife, which is something that I've taken mm, up in the, in the fiction. Yeah. Um, and he bases that on tiny little strange non sequiturs in the diary. Um, and it makes you wonder whether, you know, whether he's right or he's wrong. And it turns out the surgeon was in a sexual relationship with Robinson's daughter, and Robinson seems completely unaware of this. Wow. I did, I did uh, remember what I was going to say. was When, when Robinson got to Victoria, though, and started uh, uh, moving around amongst Victorian uh, Indigenous people, he did return to that notion of um, uh, recording culture, recording uh, uh, the sort of customs and the language and, and things of this nature. Right. So I'm not sure whether he had a, 
for, you know, he had a process by which he, he wanted to do these things. And part mm. of the process was to really understand um, the people he was dealing with. Right. Uh, and that may explain that extraordinary connection that he had, given that he was a pretty um, sort of abrasive and... Uh, Mm. and uh, unthinking in many mm. ways personality. Mm. Yeah, I must say I'm really ignorant of Robinson in Victoria. I know so little about what happened there, but yeah, it's possible that he revisited that way of thinking once he started again. Um, Don't you think you can have understanding though and not necessarily compassion or... So you can have a sort of, you know, mm. theoretical understanding without having a, an emotional connection that actually then manifests into something meaningful or worthwhile and particularly if you're coming off a mindset of superiority I mean innate superiority against an, an innately apparently benighted people that gives you all sorts of um, leeway to do all sorts of things doesn't it Jock? It certainly does and the other thing that might have been happening with Robinson in the Wybalina years was that he was actually really put upon he had an enormous amount that he had to try and coordinate in this settlement over mm. those whatever it was four years so you know, arguably he just pulled back into administrator mode mm. and, and lost touch with a lot of the things that had animated his good deeds earlier on. Mm. Um, you know, when he was walking in Tasmania, he was, at times he was stalked by settlers who wanted to kill his party. Um, th there's this incident that I've related where he killed a snake. Mm. Um, he was probably pretty brave, although he's wearing a giant velvet hat <laughs> and shiny shoes with buckles on them. He's dressed like he's walking down a main street in London mm. um, and, and yet he was pretty physically tough with it. Mm. Mm. He would have had to have been in Tasmania back then. Yeah, I think. absolutely. Mm. Still today in parts of Tasmania, still pretty tough. Uh, one last question, I think. Hello, Chuck. <laughs> um, I'm interested in um, considering uh, you know, a, a, such an incredibly well-known um, historical figure in Chaganini, why she took has a, a fairly peripheral mm. sort of role in your story um, and uh, because she's I mean she appears very strongly in his diaries especially in traveling around Tasmania and why you made that decision yeah um, thanks Mark. I, I think the answer is in the question which which was that I think Tribune is the best understood of the Tasmanians um, she's widely written about Around the time I was writing The Settlement, Cassandra Pybus was writing Drogonini Through the Apocalypse, which is a wonderful book. Um, and I felt like I wanted to try to bring other leaders of those peoples to the forefront um, and to just leave Drogonini where she is in the record. Um, the, the two books that you know, provided me with a lot of guidance, as did their authors, were Drogonini and um, Tonga Longata by Nick Clements and Henry Reynolds which are both just brilliant descriptions of these wars and, and the, um, the cursed solutions to them. And, and um, where things have been covered well in the record, I felt like that was where I didn't want to be. Um, that applies to, you know, I, I didn't write about the black line for that reason. Mm. Um, I, I didn't write about the hangings in Hobart for that reason. I tried to pick my way through the bits that were murkier in, in the hope of bringing some light to those bits, I suppose. But I think Trugnini is a fascinating subject. She, what an amazing woman. Mm. Um, and, and Cassandra Pybus makes a really good argument for the notion that she lived through the apocalypse. Um, so that um, I, I was listening to a panel last weekend or the weekend before about um, speculative fiction and there's a, a First Nations writer called Michaela Saunders was talking and she was talking about the notion that she completely rejects the idea of post-colonial writing. She said, everything's post-colonial and therefore it's not post-colonial at all. We're living it. Mm. Um, we have passed through stuff that you can't imagine in your fiction. Um, and, and to me, that's what Cassandra Pybus was saying about Truganini. Well, sadly, because I could go on talking to you for a long time, Jock, we have to end. Um, but thank you all for coming. And uh, I think it's been a fascinating conversation about a really fascinating, beautifully written book. So you, um, tonight's event has been recorded. So if you'd like to watch or listen uh, to the discussion again or recommend it to friends or family, it will be uploaded to the library's YouTube channel in the next few days. We're also delighted to have Talkie Books here tonight, selling copies of Jock's book.
and I'm sure that um, Jock will happily sign them for you. Um, I'm going to buy another copy. Um, and it's, of course, also available to borrow from our wonderful regional library, Geelong Regional Library um, service, which is the best library in the country, lucky us. Um, so thank you all again for coming and a huge thank you to Jock Sarong uh, for a wonderful conversation about his book, The Settlement. All of Jock's books are outstanding, um, but this is an amazing uh, book and definitely worth reading. Thank you, Jock. Thank you, Jen. Thanks. <laughs>